hate that voice. So like robotic. And then people should trickle in. Hi everyone, we'll just wait a minute as people join. Uh, there's a, a, few, a few second wait as people log on and then we'll kick us off. Thank you all for spending your Thursday evening with us. All right, I think we'll we'll go ahead and get started. I think we've, we have a handful of people here and um, I'm sure more people will be joining. But for those who don't know, I'm Emma Saperstein. I'm the um, EOC Gallery Coordinator for the Gallery at Cuesta College. Um, uh, this series or this event tonight is our 10th event in our laboratory series, which is a conversation series in collaboration with Race Matters San Luis Obispo, um, which is highlighting and uplifting the uh, voices of Black artists. And so we're really excited to be joined tonight by Jessica Valores, who later this evening will be joined in conversation by um, a Cal Poly student, Reagan Nicole. Um, so just to give you a sense of how um, this event will go, um, uh, we're gonna, Jessica is gonna share a bit about her work for 20, 30 minutes, however long she needs and, and takes. Uh, and then uh, Reagan will join and help facilitate a conversation. So um, come with your questions and feel free to use the Q&A and the chat um, for your questions as, as they come in throughout throughout the event and we'll make sure to get those to, to the moderator. Um, I do wanna acknowledge that the Miosi Gallery at Cuesta College is located on traditional lands of the coastal band of the Chumash Nation, including the Abis Peño, members of the Chumashan language family and, and other native peoples past and present who have made their homes along the west coast of California. Um, obviously, since we've gathered digitally, um, wherever you are, you can feel free to honor the indigenous peoples whose land you are physically gathered on in the chat. And um, so you can feel free to do that in the chat or um, just individually as you like. Um, and so I'll go ahead and introduce Jessica. So Jessica Valores is a Washington DC based interdisciplinary installation artist. Inspired by Afrofuturism, metaphysics and historical memory, Jessica builds installations and experiences that are sacred, intentional and activated. Weaving together sound collage, painting, sculpture, and facilitated events, uh, Jessica creates portals, immersive environments through which participants are invited to reconnect and conversate with personal and universal truths. Um, I, uh, the Race Matters team and myself uh, are always looking at artists that we want to invite to join us, and we are so pleased that Jessica was available and willing to share uh, this time and her work with us. So thank you, Jessica, and I will disappear and let you lead the space. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Emma. I appreciate you. Um, and thank you for this invitation to share my practice and my learnings and my process um, with this community of folks. So hello everyone and welcome for, welcome. <laughs> Thank you for joining, joining me here today. Um, my name is Jessica Valores. I am, I go by she, her, they and them. And I am calling in, tapping in from Washington DC, which is Piscataway and Nakachitank land. Um, and I am the descendant of weavers, of carpenters, of teachers, of custodians, of candy ladies, of sharecroppers, of farmers, of refugees. Um, I am the descendant of Black folks in South Carolina and Jewish folks in Lithuania, Ukraine, and Russia. And um, my ancestors are here with me today and inform my ability to show up and inform my creative practice. So I just wanna name, name the lineages and legacies that I come from. Um, and I'm an installation artist. I um, create sacred spaces that are activated through sound, through movement and dance and ritual performance. Um, through zines and collage and painting and color and gathering folks and the art that we make just in our presence. And so I'm really 
just grateful to be here. This is this is another space that I get to be creative in and share and share with. So um, yeah, I'm here to share about uh, some of my work or the work that I've been exploring around Black fugitivity. And um, I'm building, I'm building, navigating, journeying through a new body of work that really feels like um, an expansive life work called Black Fugitive Folklore. And so I want to tell you a little bit about how it started um, and what has been kind of bubbling up through the process and everything that I've been creating with is really iterative, um, using recycled materials, creating one thing that feels complete and then you know, remixing it into something else and giving it new life, um, allowing things to be temporary, allowing things to um, be destroyed and then, and then to repurpose them. Um, but I wanna start with uh, a soundscape that uh, was used for a collaboration I did with another artist in the in the residency program I was in earlier this year. Um, and yeah, so I'm gonna share my screen and just offer if you wanna close your eyes to listen to the soundscape. Um, Begin with a return. Begin with a way beyond. A way of being. A way of becoming again. when she was a girl, when she was good, oh, she, she, she brought Mississippi, when she was a girl, that, that, that one old woman run off, she did run off, the beat her so she run off, and every night she slip home, and somebody have her something to eat, something to eat, and she'd get that vittles, and going back in the woods, going back, stay in the woods. children something which in a way was after all given to us though we had to learn how to translate it because your children moving in a very different world than the one in which i grew up which you won't know anything about at all or the world in which you grew up which would be remote for him and yet he comes out of it and he's got to carry it much further than you or i will be able to carry it he's got to have respect for it but not be trapped by it precisely so you have to give both give it to him and liberate it liberate him from it Watch the stars the I run if the star run down in the western hills. Western society will see me as flesh like a bones. For us, yes, all those are there. But more importantly, there is spirit. Death is not the end, it's but the beginning of longer life. Eternity, it's rituals are quite complex. They are meant to guide the spirit, going wherever it is going, thanks to some constellation. Our forefathers were starting the stars. Oh, what the stars the iron. 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 Oh, what
watch the stars I run If the star run down in the western hills You ought to watch the stars I run Every board Watch the stars I run So Black Fugitive Folklore is a body of work that honors ancestors, Black ancestors who practice various forms of fugitivity and marinage um, and looks to their stories and also theories around fugitivity and marinage um, to inform how we, how we conceptualize um, envision what freedom and liberation looks like today and and really like learning from our ancestors learning from their practices um, so that we can be in alignment with the vision of of what liberation and full abolition looks like today and i think um, just considering the movements that we've seen and the uprisings that we've seen i mean the movements that have been happening for a long time since really before this country even existed, um, but movements around resistance and resisting oppression, resisting capitalism, resisting enslavement and genocide, um, that we are actually still living in the legacy and in the in-between space. Um, and for our, our fugitive ancestors who really are the beginnings of a movement for abolition that we're continuing in their legacy. So. Um, I think when we're in a moment now talking about the prison industrial complex, talking about um, policing uh, and abolition, that, that we, are, we are part of a larger conversation and it's important to honor um, our ancestors whose, whose, whose very bodies and movements make, make this converse, and decisions make this conversation possible. Um, and so for me, this journey actually starts um, or this particular focus um, started in December of 2019. And I came across a database called Freedom on the Move. And I'm gonna share my screen again, um, and kind of use this slideshow to, to talk through this. But um, uh, Freedom on the Move is a database that uh, is basically a crowdsourced um, or it's asking folks to help uh, transcribe runaway ads that were posted mostly in the 1800s um, and mostly in like uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, DC, Alabama, Louisiana, Florida, um, uh, that, that are basically runaway ads looking for black folks who had been enslaved and had escaped. And these ads were posted in newspapers throughout the country. Often they were posted multiple times, um, like the same ad would be posted multiple times. And they were posted both by enslavers and by sheriff's departments who would randomly pick up black folks and then post in the paper, um, who does this person belong to? Um, and so just understanding that like the conversation that we're having around incarceration and policing has its roots in, in these slave catching um, squads. Um, that, that wasn't the official term, but um, yeah. So I just wanna read two examples. Uh, this one says $25 reward. Run away from the subscriber in December last, a Negro woman named Judah. She is supposed to be lurking in or about the Newkirk settlement in New Hanover County. I will give the above reward of $25 for her apprehension and delivery to me or for her confinement in jail so that I can get her. D.L. Brock, Clinton Sampson County, North Carolina, March 29, 1860. <clears throat> this other one is a little more difficult to read, but it says $10 reward. Ran away from the subscriber on the 20th of last month, June, a Negro woman by the name of Judah about 22 years of age. She is rather slim built, small breasts, speaks and looks very fierce when spoken to, takes considerable, considerable pains with her hair 
and was somewhat yellow complected. It is expected that she is lurking about Raleigh or the Buffalo district in this county, or perhaps on White Oak or New Hope Creek in Chatham, as she or her husband have has relations in those neighborhoods. I will give a reward of $10 with much thanks to any person who will apprehend and confine her in Raleigh jail or deliver her at my house, 16 miles southwest of Raleigh, Gray B. Park Barker, July 4th, 1827. And so when I first came across this database, I was spending some time helping to tra transcribe some of the, the documents. And um, the point of the database is really to be a, a source for genealogical research and also just um, academic research on the topic. Um, but I was just really struck by the archive of resistance that existed. And so I um, would transcribe the ads on the website. I would also print them out. I would sit with them. I would pray over them. I would light candles with them. I would sing to them. At one point, I was um, underlining each person's name um, that was um, documented in the, uh, in the ads and also any description of them. Um, and for me, it was, it was an archive of folks who got away, even if it was for 10 minutes or a day, or maybe they like were able to maintain their sovereignty for some time. Um, I don't know their fate, but um, it, it offered me a sense of, of hope and uh, yeah, I was just kind of really obsessed with these documents and other people that, that were held in these documents. Um, and that, you know, I just sat with that for months. Um, I would rip up the documents at some point and then paste them onto this paper that then transforms into a flag that uh, me and a friend of mine used for, um, to celebrate Juneteenth through a, a public ritual, uh, basically a public procession in my neighborhood. Um, and in preparing for that, so I'm gonna show y'all the flags. Uh, maybe, actually, let me put this on full screen so y'all can see this better. I don't know if that, let's see. Present, there we go. Um, so uh, this first flag that you see here, this blue flag is actually has the ads that I was first working with um, that are collaged into the background to kind of create this sea slash ocean of ancestors. And on the back of the flag, it says, we freed ourselves, which for me was an important message that, that came through in, in the creation of this work and just sitting with this work. Um, and, uh, what was important in that statement was that it was redefining this narrative around emancipation, around freedom, around liberation, that in this country often gets very whitewashed and, and has a, a social amnesia around it. Um, and particularly at this time, this was Juneteenth 2020, it was soon after the uprisings um, that had happened um, in response to the murder of George Floyd. And Juneteenth was now like a national conversation and folks who had never known about it were talking about it. City governments were trying to find ways to celebrate it. And it was, um, it was troubling for me. Uh, in one way, I was, I was happy that more people knew about this holiday, but also the narrative that was was getting shared was this narrative around this kind of white savior general that goes marches into Galveston, Texas and lets these black enslaved folks know that they, they are free. And um, it totally erased how emancipation even became possible through the resistance of in black enslaved people. And so for me, what was coming through when the ancestors were like, we freed ourselves, we're like research, like come back, no, come back and study what are all the ways that we made emancipation possible and actually continue to make that, that possible and that um, the fight for, for full abolition possible. Um, so these flags emerged through that. And I'll just say that my, my creative practice is a combination of study, of ritual, and of play. And so some of these are really intuitive. Um, this first one, 
uh, it, it just felt like this is what they wanted me to create. And so I created it. The second one came from a dream that I had of, um, I had a dream about Harriet Tubman and this door that she was walking through. And so this is a representation of that door. And this third one, um, I was in the practice um, during Black August of taking walks to the water every day. And um, so I found this branch that, that was calling to me. I'm just like, yeah, I wanna, be, I wanna be worked into this flag. And so I'm still kind of thinking about what, is, what, are, the, what are these flags? What do they represent? Um, uh, but I've been calling them fugitive flags. And uh, yeah, so sorry, this is getting a little windy, but uh, so uh, after Juneteenth, what I felt called towards was to, to immerse myself in uh, study ritual and creative practice for the full month of August and totally black out everything else in my life, cancel any other obligations so that I could be fully immersed in the study of black fugitive practices. And part of that meant um, listening to talks around Black fugitivity, um, reading books around Black fugitivity, but also around um, like the actual narratives of escaped um, Black folks. And um, read, watching, I watched like the full, all the seasons of Underground and um, all the music that I was listening to. Like it was, I was basically curating um, what I was consuming and making sure that everything had to do with um, Black fugitivity in some form. And so here are some of the things that came out of that, that space um, where uh, I've been in the practice of creating micro paintings out of recycled cardboard and found objects. And so here are some of the ones that have been emerging. And I've been thinking of them as these kind of like rival geographies um, something that's been coming up a lot in, in the study is, is that is understanding different forms of marinage practices in the United States. And for those of you who are not familiar, marinage is basically the practice of escaping enslavement. And um, Black folks, specifically in Jamaica, were called maroons who would escape into the mountains. And in other parts of the Caribbean, um, uh, there are whole maroon communities and they were able to like set up like their own sovereign um, villages uh, so and and had so much sovereignty really that they were able to trade with other people they were able to raid plantations and and set other people free um, but the conversation around Marat marinage in the United States is usually focused around um, the Underground Railroad and as I was reading, what I was discovering was that there was this whole other narrative of folks escaping and rather than escaping north, that they were actually escaping to find their families on other plantations. And so some folks who had either been sold away from, from a plantation and would go back to the plantation they were sold from or folks whose families had been sold away and they would try and follow their family to wherever they were. Um, being sold to mothers, daughters, wives, husbands, children. Um, and for those folks, and, and varying on the year, um, like the year and the location, uh, like about 50% of folks who are escaping one, their enslavement, were escaping to practice some form of marinage that wasn't necessarily going north to live in a free state. Um, and so some folks would set up on the borderlands of plantations. Um, they would dig homes, like dig into the ground to live underground. Some folks would live in trees. There's um, also hinterland marinage. So some folks would live like deep into the swamps, um, living without a trace, uh, living in silence. Um, and, and yeah, so in one of, one of the books um, uh, that I was reading, uh, Stephanie Camp talks about petite marinage versus grand marinage. So folks who would escape away for good and some folks who would escape for a few days at a time or a few months at a time. And she talks about this rival geography, like this space on the borderlands of plantations that, that, that ruptures this, this kind of like all consuming captivity or ruptures the idea that that is, that is the truth and the law of the land. And um, Stephanie Camp kind of expands the idea of petite marinage to also think about the ways that people are practicing their own sovereignty even while enslaved. And especially for black women who are enslaved, 
um, because their movements are more confined on the um, in the plantation and they're they're more harshly punished um, when they attempt escape that most black women were practicing forms of petite marinage where they would escape into the woods for a few days and then come back um, or or they would procure supplies or harbor somebody in their quarters or fix a plate for somebody and leave it in the woods or it wouldn't really necessarily be a plate but it'd be like a pouch of food or, or grains to leave somebody um, who would be in the woods um, and then also practices of like these illicit dance parties like very secret dance parties where people would risk everything to to gather and dance and make music together um, and so just ways that that black folks are finding ways to to practice agency over their bodies even while in, in enslavement and so these micro paintings for me represent this kind of like marginal liminal space of like between enslavement and liberation and kind of like the psycho spiritual ways that we navigate that. Um, and I just started making a lot of things. <laughs> so these are these um, like prototype dioramas um, uh, inspired by um, different fugitive practices. So I've been thinking about uh, the cosmos and how those are also an ally for, for black fugitives and looking at the stars Nat Turner uses, um, there's an eclipse and then a, a dot that he sees in the sun that is like, that's his, that's his, like the message he received that it was go time to rebel and resist. Um, and so different forms of, of uh, like cosmic and metaphysical allies. Um, and then I was also feeling really called to invite my not necessarily invite, they kind of demanded. My Jewish ancestors were like, we're here for this black liberation. We wanna be a part of this process. And so what I was feeling called to do was to explore um, uh, Jewish practices uh, that were related to fugitivity. And so one is this practice of creating a sukkah. And a sukkah is um, a ritual that is used to commemorate Sukkot, which is actually a holiday of fugitivity and um, and looks at the story of Exodus and Moses, which is actually a story that then gets remixed in, in terms of black, black theology, black liberation theology, um, and, and, and gives hope and inspiration for black folks on this side of the, on this side of the pond um, to escape. And uh, so, yeah, so for the sukkah is basically a, a three-walled structure and you're supposed to, to live in it for seven days and invite other folks in, invite your ancestors in. Um, it's supposed to be made of natural materials um, or certain parts have to be made of natural materials. And so I uh, used car repurposed cardboard and we pasted it with all of the runaway slave ads that I've been working with. Um, and then invited community to come in and experience the sukkah, we had a soundscape playing and folks kind of made it their own. Some folks came in and took naps. Some folks uh, had children who would play in it and dance in it. Some folks uh, had an elder who came through and started just telling stories about her childhood and um, folks just gathered around. So it kind of took on a life of its own and it was temporary. And so after a few days it rained and it was destroyed. And I brought in all the remnants of that and have been finding ways to rework those remnants and give them new life through other, through other pieces. Um, and so that, well, how do I get out of this? Okay, uh, that transformed into this. So a lot of the cardboard from that is actually what makes this wall here. Um, and this was this, the next iteration of the sukkah, um, which actually started as an altar and it laid, it laid flat. Um, and then at some point it, it felt like it wanted to stand up. And so uh, I stood it up and uh, this got shared as part of a activation during Black History Month um, by SWAP DC. And um, uh, I'm totally forgetting the other hosting organization. Uh, but uh, they were hosting a series of events. And so we created this sacred space um, uh, called Altered Code. Uh, and within, within this wall it are uh, these small micro paintings. So you'll see on the, this left-hand side right here, 
what I started to do was that one, I was feeling uncomfortable with the, um, the actual runaway ads. And so at some point I was tearing them, like at first I would treat them as a sacred object. I would uh, highlight the person's name and any description of them. And then I would rip up the actual piece of paper as a way to kind of like destroy the document, but like keep the information. And so I, I kind of leaned into that and, and uh, use my practice of micro paintings of thinking about how can I extract the data from the runaway ads and code it into these micro paintings then that, that then become this larger landscape. And so on here, you'll see um, each stitch represents a letter or a number, which will tell you who the person is, like it will spell their name and will tell you how old they are. If it had their height, you'll see these boxes, which will represent their height. If it had which date, they escaped, it'll say their date. So this person escaped on February 4th. And then there are small pictographs, which also rep represent other information that would be would have been present in the ad. So this triangle represents somebody who was harbored, which suggests that they had some type of family in the area or somebody who was looking out for them. And this small plant represents that this person had siblings and that was mentioned in the ad. Um, and so I think these things are important because there's um, all of this information about our ancestors that, that also informs like that these people were not alone. This wasn't a single uh, act that, that actually there were whole networks of complicity where we were helping each other to free ourselves, to free each other. Um, and, and the type of um, kind of clandestine organizing that was required in order to make flight and marinage and escape um, possible um, for me is really inspiring and makes me think about like, well, what are the ways that we are creating networks of complicity now to, to get each other free and to make freedom possible, even in the, in, in, in um, the, the aftermath of slavery. And so part of this practice has also been about creating codes um, and, uh, I've also, I have a practice of making zines. And so I kind of revisited that as a way to um, just process different ways of knowing. Sometimes information will come to me through a song or through a dream, um, or I'll be doodling and this image comes up or I'll be like experiencing some emotion in my body. And so I'm like, well, let me draw what this feels like um, or what this sounds like. And um, so the zines are kind of like allowing different forms of information to inform this, this folklore or this cosmology of Black fugitivity. Um, so I just wanted to show you some, some photos of those scenes. Um, and then here are some of the fugitive practices that I've been kind of like teasing out. And there are actually lots of them, but uh, here are some of the ones that I've been marinating on. Um, the practice of cousins and, and creating groups across bloodlines. Um, one thing that was like, because of the domestic slave trade in the United States, folk, Black folks end up having people sold all across the country. And so it actually supports us in creating networks of complicity because it's like, oh, I got a cousin in Virginia. I could connect you to my grandmother in Mississippi who knows somebody who worked for somebody in South Carolina, right? And so these ways that, that we kind of form family um, and also thinking about like a lot of times when we talk about fugitivity, we talk about escape from, but we're not talking about escape to. And a lot of Black folks were escaping to reconstitute some form of family or found family along the way. Um, and then there are all type, all of these are other fugitive practices, which I think are also metaphors for how we exist today and how we imagine um, aligning ourselves with movements for liberation. So thinking about harboring, how are we creating space for each other? How are we keeping each other safe? Thinking about mutual aid efforts, digging, um, which it was like an actual practice of digging in the ground and creating homes. But for me, I'm thinking that as a metaphor of like, well, what are we excavating? What are we, what are we like trying to find out or tease out? Um, hush and listen um, and like really leaning into silence, listening to nature, listening to cues and codes and signs, uh, stargazing, scars. So I'm, I'm, in a lot of the runaway ads, there's um, reference to scars people had as like a way to, to mark them or to, to, in, to indicate like, oh, this is my boy or my um, property. 
Um, but for me, a scar is evidence of resistance because most people would, would obtain scars. One, be just the terror of being on a, on a plantation and being enslaved, but two, be, being punished because they were doing something that resisted um, that enslavement. The practice of dreaming, uh, the practice of fixing a plate, leaving a plate in the woods, like caring for people in that way. So thinking about forms of collective care. Um, so these are some of the things that have been emerging. And uh, yeah, I guess I just wanted to end this presentation um, with, with the beginning, actually. One of the, one of the, there have been several beginnings of this process, but um, one of the first artifacts was creating an incantation bowl, which is a Judaic practice of um, like a protection ritual where you call in your ancestors to, um, to protect them and to protect your family. And so uh, I've been engaging that ritual um, or started this process by engaging, you know, my own genealogy, my own heritage um, to really honor how ritual and stillness and listening can and study is like as loud of, as, of a liberation practice as, you know, fighting back in the streets and, and doing policy work, like all of it's connected. And um, yeah, I think for me, it's like honoring the spirit, the spirit of, of resistance, the spirit of liberation. So I'll end by just sharing this video. It's about five minutes. And it was a commission piece that I got to do as part of Black Water, which was commissioned by Ebony Noel Golden, who is an incredible artist and mentor of mine. And, um, and she gathered a bunch of Black artists to explore the, the water as a liberation technology for Black folks. And so this was, this was a part of that work as well. surrender to the peace as in the still of the night still to ease to quiet the noise pause presence as in still your mind or on the other hand to pause with vigilance, to wait, to wade, to watch, as in hold still, or on the other, other hand, to get your hair did, as in hold still, child, still, as in depth, as in value unseen, or not yet understood, as in still waters run deep. Still, a colloquial pronunciation of steel, as in steal away, as in run away, 
as in take back your time and can also mean still away as in there is still a way or also as in still a way of being still to remain to return to continue on as in still here still standing still got it Okay, so I'll stop there. I know I went way over time. I apologize. You do not need to apologize. That was um, just a, such an honor to, to listen to you share about your work. It seems like Reagan can't join us um, today. Um, and so we send her our grace and our love and our well wishes. It's been a really heavy week. Um, so I am going to jump in and help sort of moderate Q&A, but Jessica, um, if, if you want to share more at any point or, you know, you, you still hold the space. And um, so I am just going to help sort of moderate and, and, and pass on some questions. Um, I have lots of scratched notes <laughs> of like little phrases that you use that I really connected with. And um, you mentioned um, this living in the in-between space a couple of times in a couple of different ways. And I think um, for me that connected in, in terms of your, um, your real emphasis on taking time and taking breath and, and all of that informing your work and your practice. So um, if you're willing, um, you know, I, I'd love if you could speak more on that. Yeah. Um... When I first uh, kind of immersed myself in study, so I took all of August as like, as a way to honor the tradition of Black August to be in study around fugitivity. Um, and when I, that, that first week, I really like, I was, I hadn't even opened any like stories. Like I just was thinking about fugitivity as a metaphor. And so there were certain questions that I asked of myself. I was like, what are the things that I'm running from? what are the things that I'm running towards and who am I beholden to? And those were kind of like these three questions that anchored my exploration. Um, and thinking about the ways that I also live in this, this in-between space. I think, you know, collectively we're in this in-between space, like we're in between enslavement and mm -hmm. something beyond that, <laughs> like mm -hmm. or enslavement and liberation, like we're still in, mm -hmm in that in between. But um, I think for me it was also like, well, how does that live in my body and, and the ways that I think my own heritages intersect in my body and have, have, have created a space where I feel like I'm, I'm multiple things and mm -hmm. 
and beyond that and inside of that and like thinking in, in terms of like spectrums and kind of like breaking this idea of like there are these binary ways of, mm -hmm. of, of thinking and um, or that are imposed on us. And so, so yeah, I think for me being in that in-between space is about what are, the, what are the practices that allow me to sustain myself? What are the medicines? What, what can I, um, who are the allies? What are the allies that can help me sustain? Because I don't know how long I'll be in this in-between space. I don't know if there's ever an end to the in-between space. Mm -hmm. um, and I imagine that our ancestors were also, were also kind of um, dealing with that too. Of like, what do I need to do to survive so that someone else can survive, right? And um, so for me, it's really been thinking about like, well, who are my allies? What plants, what stars, um, what tools, what resources, what people I made sure to like create a care team for myself before I really immerse myself in this study because I knew that I need people to be connected to and who could, who could anchor me and hold space for me and ask mm -hmm. me questions and hold me accountable and challenge me and, and also encourage me um, and hold me in this. So um, yeah, for me, the in-between is about like uh, practice and, and what, are, what are the tools that we're cultivating and, and the practices that we are, that we are um, using to, to be in alignment with the kind of world we wanna see regardless of if we know we will see it or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and then being comfortable with change and being comfortable with the unknown, mm -hmm. being comfortable with letting go. Um, I like went down a real deep rabbit hole of genealogical research mm -hmm. and that research is like, I, I was able to name for the first time an, an, my, an ancestor who was born in slavery and and live to see um, emancipation. Um, and her name is actually Judah. And so the first, when I was looking up um, the runaway slave ads, I was just looking up ads with the name Judah and I knew it wasn't her, you know what I mean? I was like, none of these folks are from the place in South Carolina that she's from, but there was something in that, like that, that, that in-between space, that imaginative, like, the way that like our memory is also our imagination too. And, and in some way in honoring the people that shared her name and may have shared her experience can also honor her. And so the in-between space is also like this, like there's a, there's a space where it's fuzzy, where there's, there's multiple ways of knowing, there's multiple ways of creating, there's multiple ways of making sense of a thing or understanding a thing. Um, and it can kind of be like a dream dream space where it's not, where we have some agency in that and we can we can kind of create that so i hope that oh yeah clear. i'm just like keep talking keep talking <laughs> um it's um yeah i mean i think it's so interesting that you're uh you know you mentioned also and it's so evident in your the you know the body of work that you shared with us tonight and i know you do so much more than what you shared this evening but um uh, just this, the different scales, like this micro macro, like this very personal and, you know, personal memory, family memory, your own ancestors, and then, um, you know, a more collective memory, I think is, is really evident and, and present. Yeah. Um, and I'm all about, so, I, it, you know, resource alert, emergent strategy by Adrian Marie Brown. Mm -hmm. But um, in that book, she talks about small is all. Mm -hmm. And who? So I, I just be needing a reminder, right? Like every little thing we do actually has an echo, has an impact, has a vibration in the world. And um, sometimes things feel really big and overwhelming. And like even this week, like I've had moments where I was just like, "What is this for? Why am I doing what I'm doing?" Right? But if I can kind of like locate a name, a person a piece of card, a piece of cardboard or nail or scrap, like there's something that like can anchor me in, in the small things. Um, and yeah, and I just think about fractals too, like how are we, how are we working in alignment with the things that we want to see and like allowing that to, to reverberate and, and be contagious. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also in all honesty, like the micro paint just started because I was like way overwhelmed by a canvas and I was just yeah. like, 
this is too much. I can't fathom something this big. So let me just work with something I can fit in my hands. And um, actually that I really love, I really love small things. So yeah, there's such a like a, a gesture of intimacy and yeah, that something that you can hold in your hands is actually quite kind of rare, you know, that's yeah. not like my phone or, you know, um, right. yeah. It and, really and it's also, I mean, it, I think also about like, you know, when black folks were escaping, what could they take with them? Mm -hmm. And there are actually stories of people like bringing whole beds, like mm -hmm. actually folks found real innovative ways to like get resources that they needed or, or materials. Um, mm -hmm. But for the most part, people were, were taking small things, bits of cloth, or also like repurposing things. So um, for folks who don't know about the Great Dismal Swamp, th that was actually a a space it's a it's a huge swamp that spans parts of um virginia and north carolina mm -hmm. and uh there's a historian who's been or art, i think he's an archaeologist who's been doing a lot of work in in trying to find um like the artifacts of folks who had lived in that in that swamp and uh, that it it's like projected that there were like about hundreds of people of black folks who escaped into the Great Dismal Swamp at various points um, throughout the 17 and 1800s. But what's one of the things that he finds is like the the evid like the artifacts are these like real small bits of like just like a piece of the head of a nail mm -hmm. or um, uh, like an arrowhead that then was that was then repurposed. So like there were indigenous folks who were living in the swamps in the 1700s. And then when black folks were like escaping to the swamps in the 1800s were repurposing some of the materials that they found to make their own homes or, or their own clothes or whatever they needed to do to get by in that moment. And so it just makes me think about like, what are the small things that like, that, that actually make a, some form of living possible? Um, yeah. And it's so connected to how you, I mean, just from what I understand, like how you've been engaging with the idea of the archive and personal archive, collective archive, et cetera. Like, I think there's such a relationship there and uh, resonance like uh, throughout. What yeah. You've heard. Um, um, we have a couple of audience questions if you are okay with it. And, and I do want to, for some of these, I want to, um, and just for the dialogue in general, I do want to acknowledge that I am a white person who like directly benefits from the systems and structures of white supremacy and I, I will make mistakes and cause harm so um, I'm asking for your forgiveness in advance um, if the phrasing of the questions and you you know that um, you can always not answer whatever you want <laughs> and this space is yours um, but uh, somebody asked if you would be willing to elaborate a little bit more about your artistic practice and how you view it or contextualize it as an expression of protest or activism you know, in this moment and, um, and whether you, you felt comfortable elaborating on that. Yeah, I mean, I exist, mm -hmm. period. <laughs> like for me, that is, that is resistance in a world that would rather that I don't exist or that I exist only for the good of, um, you know, a white, heteronormative, patriarchal capitalist structure. And then my whole livelihood go toward maintaining that and, and, and sustaining that and actually existing for me outside of that or, or within that, but with my own agency is, uh, is a form of resistance. And um, yeah, I think I'm really inspired by Stephanie Camp's work. And she talks about petite marinage practices of black women. Mm -hmm who um, often we're, it was harder for a black woman to escape a plantation um, because of the ways that they were confined on a plantation, the expectations around domestic work and also like family um, and the ways that black women were punished more harshly for attempting escape. And so Stephanie Camp talks about all of these forms of petite marinage where basically when black women were finding ways to have agency over their bodies, even within captivity. And that was a form of resistance. And um, so she talks about um, these, these dance parties, uh, spiritual gatherings in the woods. She talks about um, dress and like the ways that we would adorn ourselves um, 
where they would adorn themselves. Um, but I think about like that when I, you know, I got dressed today and I was like, okay, yeah, what, what am I going to wear that makes me feel alive? You know, and I'm wearing this solar plexus shirt. And, like, um, and I know for some, maybe that feels like, okay, you're just living. But for me, that feels like it, it speaks back, it's, it speaks back to, to a machine that, that wants me to operate as a commodity. And um, so there's that. Um, and then also, I think it's important for me to just be in conversation and use my work at, or share my work and my study as a way, and my learning as a way to affirm Black folks who are organizing and folks who are organizing, you know, with Black folks around liberation, um, around abolition, around um, all types, <laughs> all types of of issues and racial justice and reproductive justice and environmental justice issues. And so I think for me, it's important to, because that's a community that I came, that I'm deeply connected to, um, that the spaces that I create are around affirming those, affirming those conversations, affirming that work, and also like contextualizing that work, like, oh yeah, no, you are a part of a whole legacy of people and like allow this, this artwork to, to just share the medicine of that. Um, so that so that you can you know so at least those organizers or or folks who are just witnessing my work can feel emboldened and strengthened and and find some type of like yeah medicine and, and nutrients in in the work that I share and in the study that I'm doing and so for me it's just like I think I'm I'm starting to see my creative practice as as a way of um, it's like a tincture <laughs> like. Mm -hmm. Here's a little nugget here. Here's a little nugget there. Like, um, yeah. And I think, yeah. I hope that doesn't sound. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm feeling away about how that sounds. <laughs> no, yeah, no. I feel like, oh, I got to do a big thing. Like, I got to show up at the the protest, or I got to make this big statement. And it's actually like, no. Like, what are the relationships? What are the ways that that this work is is sustainable? And so for me, it's like kind of like teasing that out and and figuring that out in practice. Yeah, I mean, I haven't had extensive conversations with um, one of the organizations that put this event on with you, Race Matters, but I know that there is just on Instagram, I've seen a lot of, um, or a, a few posts that are really focused on, yeah, healing, healing spaces, community, intimacy, um, rather than sort of necessarily always being an educator or, um, uh, so I think that, yeah, there's, um, it's definitely sort of timely, um, those yeah. efforts. My background is in education. So mm -hmm. I spent most of my, my young adult and adult life working with black and brown young folks mm -hmm. and uh, creating liberatory spaces with young folks. So I think that definitely informs my work and like mm -hmm. academicness of like, you know, I'll geek out about things. And like, oh, I wanted to learn more about my and let me tell you all the different forms of it. And um yeah just finding different ways to 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 share that and allow that to be felt and, and experienced so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i was um watching your instagram the other day um and you or maybe maybe it was a few weeks ago uh and you were speaking about um sadia hartman and your um engagement <sighs> with her work i'm in the middle of one of her books right now and so um I can't even remember what it's called. It's the most recent one. Um, lives? Yes, that one. Yeah, yeah. Wayward Lives. Yeah, there's a, a group. Yeah, of I haven't read it yet, but that is that's on like the top of my wish list right now. Yeah, I'm loving it. I mean, I feel like it's um, there's so many like the way she tells stories and the way um, uh, she sort of embodies characters and. Um, it, it, I don't know if this is common for her, but in Wayward Lives, she's you know using images and she's kind of using yes. these images to guide these, fic, you know, um, rooted in reality, but often fictionalized to yeah, some extent. Speculative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speculative, thank you. Um, but um, I feel like I have to like engage it in really small doses because I wanna sit with the characters that I'm listening to and, mm -hmm. um, and in the space with, you know, and um, I was just, I've been wanting to ask you offline, but here we are. So <laughs> I've been wanting to ask about, you know, how you, how you engage with her work. And I can tell you um, 
Yeah, I geek out about Sadia Hartman. Also, Tina Camp is a really amazing intellectual. Tina Camp, Stephanie, Stephanie Camp, Fred Moten, like I think they're all in this like this conversation around fugitivity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've, I've just listened to a lot of Sadia's talk, talks and then also uh, <laughs> recently finished Lose Your Mother and which like just blew my mind. And at one point in Lose Your Mother, she's talking about black fugitive practices on the continent of West Africa and, and looking at the domestic slave trade that ha that continued on a hundred years beyond the, the end of the triangular trade. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, she's just phenomenal and I feel inspired by her work um, in the way. And you mentioned, you mentioned Tina Camp too. I think I also have read some of recently. She did, she's well, the one she's who Images too. Listening she, to images, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's important. Like there, uh, I was in conversation with a friend of mine a few weeks ago about um, ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. And actually, I mean, there. so there's this other book I haven't read. I've only read um, descriptions about the book, but it's called The Alphabet and the Goddess. And they talk about um, how the existent, the like the technology of writing has a correlation with the development of societies that are hierarchical and patriarchical. Mm -hmm. And then when we read, when we read language, it actually works a different part of our brain than when we read images. Mm -hmm. And so for me, part of like thinking about code and symbolism and code can be something that's like written, but also code could be something that is like choreographed um, or sung, um, but thinking about like, images and in other ways of um like tactilely like knowing a thing or feeling a thing that's that 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 goes beyond text um and so i think it's interesting to see academics like sadia hartman and tina camp who are like they're writers like that's that's what they do but they're mm -hmm. like using image and sound like this this practice of listening as a way to like to engage different ways of knowing um which I think is so important because that's like, I feel like that's also a, another form of like resistance, like resisting the way that we've been trained to think mm -hmm. and trained to understand and trained to communicate. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, with with uh, Wayward Lives, I, um, I think it's, uh, I mean, just in my experience of it is that it's a, the way of engaging with images, like you mentioned, is something that I, I mean, I don't do, um, super like the way uh, she's activating these images is um unusual i think for us and and the way we interact with our you know instagram and social media and see images and the news cycle and all of that which i know is you know all of that is a popular topic of conversation but um, the the through line between your work and her work of deep listening and um and the and the um performance not I mean not in a performative sense but in in um, the sense of it being truly embodied of how you're engaging with the names of the um, you know the crowdsourced ads the, the names that you're engaging with the how you're um, using them as tactile objects I wonder um, if you don't mind speaking to that um, to the, the embodiment <laughs> in your work I'm actually struggling with that right now I'm like once something becomes physical, mm -hmm. it has a spirit. Mm -hmm. And so I actually have like so much of the cardboard from the sukkah and I, I like, so I brought all of the cardboard in, all the ads that had been wheat pasted onto the cardboard, I, as best as possible, like um, took them off. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't throw them away. Like I can't, and I haven't figured out a way, I've been trying to find a way to like, incorporate them into other things, other iterations of the work as it's being built. Mm -hmm. But I struggle with how to honor the spirit of, of each person that I've like, in, that I've invited in. And mm -hmm. like, I can't be like, get out now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like now they're, they're here. And so actually I've been sitting with like making these micro paintings and I've only made about like a little over 30 of them, but there are 300 people so I'm just like, okay, this is my responsibility to like keep coming back to, keep sitting, keep mm -hmm. sitting with you, keep sit, saying that your name, keep honoring like what I know about you. Um, 
but yeah, I've kind of like created a, um, I don't know. I've like called forth the spirit that I'm like, okay, now I need to continue to tend to tend to you and, and to the ways that this altar continues to rebuild itself. Mm-hmm. It's not a um, temporary relationship that you've cultivated. Right oh, now. like the structure might be temporary, but the materials still exist, mm-hmm. right? And so it's like, well, how do I give this material new life or um, honor it in the way that it wants to be honored? And I'm still figuring that out. Like right now, the papers are sitting in this this bucket that I have in my um, in my studio and. Mm-hmm. Every now and then I'll take one out and sit with it. And it's just like, there's so much. And this is only 300. Like they're on the database. There's thousands of mm-hmm. ads. And mm-hmm. I've, I only had, and I don't even know if I actually had the capacity for the 300 that I, that I printed, but it's like, okay. Yeah, each, each person is a whole world, it's a whole universe. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, so I'm still trying to figure out. And I think, just listening for like, tell me what you want me to do. Like even when I when I first started printing out the ads um, last uh, last last December, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I I sat with them for a long time, and then I started I underlined them, I tore them up, I pasted them onto what became that flag. And then I didn't know what to do with it. And I just rolled it up and left it in my closet for a few months. And then in June, during Juneteenth, it was like, oh, this is the flag. Like th- that became clear. It was like, oh, they were telling me like, pull the flag out. Like that's, that's what we're here for. Mm-hmm. Um, but it took months for me to know what that was supposed to be. And I still, and now I'm like, okay, now the flag is made. And then the flag got incorporated into altered code. Mm-hmm. Um, it's gotten incorporated into the other projects that friends of mine have done. Um, but I'm clear that sustainability there, you know, that. Yeah, it has its own journey. And I'm just here to really just be like, tell me what you want to do. I mean, just in the, in the world of education of which you are deeply familiar and, you know, we're often telling students to listen to their work, you know, and Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm just, God, I'm just, I'm very inspired by the way that you are so prioritized listening to your work and um, responding to it and responding to the spirits and the energies that exist within it. I think it makes, um, it's, it's a good model for, um, for so many of us <laughs> um, yeah. as, as we engage our own work. Um, I, uh, we're, we have a few minutes left, but um, I just wanted to ask, I, I've spent some time this week with your phone home project Mm. Um, and I, I really love um, that work. And um, I don't know if you feel like you want to speak to it or um, speak to, you know, I was really intrigued and interested in, in, the, in the idea of home and healing within that work particularly. Um, so yeah. if you are willing, I'd love to hear more. Yeah, I haven't talked about that work in a while. Uh, it feels so long ago, even though it was only a few years ago. Um, yeah, funny how that happens. <laughs> Yeah, Phone Home was my first like official installation. I have Mm -hmm. a good friend in Austin, Texas who works at the Carver Museum um, and cultural, the George Washington Carver Museum and Mm -hmm. Cultural Center. Mm -hmm. And um, they had invited me to put up an installation. And at that time I was mostly just doing like paintings and like 2D, 2D -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. Um, I had like dabbled in some video stuff and some sound stuff, but um, they really just were like, you have a room, so figure out how you wanna activate it. And yeah, it kind of like expanded what I thought was possible. And, and um, I had been working with uh, what I'm calling the Ziga Afrophilo Cosmology, mm-hmm. which is a, uh, it's a series of manifestos that for me speak to um, the ways that black folks are navigating being both magical and marginalized Mm -hmm. and being 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 both and and beyond all of that and um and what are the technologies that we use to to create to imagine to remember what home is what home means Mm -hmm. and so that installation is um it's one two i think it's six different phones and then a phone altar Mm-hmm. And each phone represents a different 
interpretation of home. So there's home as the body, home as the earth, home as um, the water and divine feminine energy, uh, home as the cosmos, home as pneumaticism and travel, mm -hmm. home as children and elders. Mm -hmm. And so each phone has a different um, soundscape that, that speaks to that interpretation. Um, and I was actually able to interview over 40 um, activists, organizers, friends, cultural organizers that I'm inspired by and incorporate their voices into, into the different soundscapes that are playing in that space. And um, yeah, it was just really special and kind of like a, a beginning for me to imagine like, oh, how do we engage sacred space through sound, through like, through image, through altar, through, you know, kind of um, bringing together ritual and study. For me, the study was like interviews and just like engaging with people's what, like, how do you create home? What does home mean for you? And yeah, so it was just really an honor to build that work. And I think started me on a trajectory of like really expanding how I was thinking about visual art mm -hmm. um, and thinking of it more as like, how does, how does it create a space for a story or a feeling or an affirmation um, and for spirit, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the highlight of that actually was that at the time I was working at Roosevelt High School in DC. And um, so I had put the installation up. I had applied for this grant to bring two students out with me to like do these different um, artist talks and just kind of be like my assistants in the space. Um, and when I brought it back to my students, they were like, you can't just take two of us. And I was like, well, I ain't got the money for more than two. <laughs> It's like, well, we gonna fundraise. And so I actually got to bring a group of my, my dream team at the time, my dream team of students out to Austin, Texas. And they helped me put on a whole community festival. It was like a brought in vendors and music, local music artists um, to celebrate like Afrofuturistic technologies of home. And it was really beautiful. So, Amazing. yeah. Yeah, I linked, or my colleague Stephanie linked um, for anybody who's listening. Um, and <laughs> I hope that we can work with you in this community at some point in person. I don't know if you travel to California often, but. Not during COVID, I don't, <laughs> um, but yeah, maybe virtually. Yeah. Virtual collaborations are cool. For sure. Um, well, I'm gonna ask, um, I, I, I so appreciated the, um, uh, the soundscape that you played earlier. And I think that um, if you're willing, I think that's a really nice way to end if you have other soundscapes or you wanna play that again as people are leaving. And um, mm -hmm. um, I think it's a nice way to close together if you agree. Yeah, I'll actually, um, I was like, which soundscape should I play? And there's um, the soundscape that I played uh, when the sukkah was activated that actually includes uh, my great uncle talking about our family uh, or, or sharing a family story. Mm -hmm. So I'll play it, but also the soundscape's like 30 minutes. So just, you know, don't stay for the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe, why don't you play it? People can filter out. And then when the last yeah. person is left, I will close everything. And you can feel free to leave good. as well. <laughs> thank and you. I'm going to remove myself from video. Also, thank you so much, Jessica, for this space. Yeah. Thank you for having me and inviting me to share. Yeah. All right. All right. Let me, I have to pull it up first. Okay, cool. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay. My grandma Epstein was daddy's uh, grandmother. Mm -hmm. She was his paternal grandmother. Mm -hmm. And um and her one of her children. Uncle Son uh, refused to get off the sidewalk downtown for a white man. And so the white man slapped him. And he took his knife out and cut him. And so, and then to spirit him out of, out, of, out of town, and he went to Florida and stayed there forever. He, and he never came back home. And, um, and, and they, at one point, they were going to, the, the, there was a band of white people that decided they were going to uh, come and get Uncle Son and hang him. Mm -hmm. And the Browns and the, the Browns and the Brunsons, 
Well, Epson was the, uh, the, the Brunson married to the Browns. Okay. Yeah. They, the, the Browns got together and um, and then they uh, got their arms together and everything and, and um, the guns and, and bullets and uh, and and they stationed various children in trees so that they could see the white the white people coming. And and, and Grandma Epsy slung the gun over her shoulder and tied her her hem, the hem of her dress up around her waist. And uh, and she walked the streets and said, it, it, I walk knee deep in my blood before I allow somebody to come and get one of my children. And so that 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 spirit was that was a story that we were told as children. Yeah. And so that that story just it I don't know what it did it mean something to you all. Oh, absolutely. Because it meant something well, to me. It, it made me. It it said to me that that I come from better stuff. Yeah. Than than to let anyone run over me. Yeah. place where we was, I never hear them say they run off over there, run off. Other places I hear them stay in the woods and uh, so long until they wear the clothes off them, slip up. Now I heard mama say when she was a girl, when she was a girl, no, she, she, she brought from Mississippi, when she was a girl, that, that, that one old woman run off, she did run off, the beat her so she run off. And every night she slip home and somebody have her something to eat, something to eat. And she get that vittles and go on back in the woods, go on back, stay in the woods. And they, you know, just uh, they tell the other, you know, could you see, I don't know what their name, see so-and-so, ever see them? Say no. Well, you tell them if they come home, we ain't going to whoop them. We ain't going to whoop them if they come home. Well, that'd be all the way, you know, they come. Said once the man stayed in the woods so long. Tell you his hair on him long like a dog. Well, just grow up, you know, and stay in the woods. Just stayed in the woods. And they couldn't get him out. Change changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. This movement of things can be felt and touched and exists in language and in fantasy. It is flight, it is motion, it is fugitivity itself. Fugitivity is not only escape or exit or exodus. Fugitivity is being separate from settling. It is a being in motion.
glad I'm gone. Find myself a home. who cannot indulge the passing dreams of choice, who love in doorways coming and going, in the hours between dawns, looking inward and outward, at once before and after, seeking a now that can breed futures. Like bread in our children's mouths, so their dreams will not reflect the death of ours. For those of us who were imprinted with fear, like a faint line in the center of our foreheads, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk, for by this weapon, this illusion of some safety to be found, the heavy-footed hope to silence us. For all of us, this instant and this triumph, we were never meant to survive. And when the sun rises, we are afraid it might not remain. When the sun sets, we are afraid it might not rise in the morning. When our stomachs are full, we are afraid of indigestion. When our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may never eat again. When we are loved, we are afraid love will vanish. When we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So, it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. I am sending you love. I'm just going to pause it there. It could go on for a lot longer. It's so good, though. And we yeah. have people hanging on. Um, do you have a link to your SoundCloud? Uh, I think it's, it's, I can post the link in here. Um, I'm, I'm just poking around. If you're willing to share, I think, for yeah, those who are sure. sticking around and want to finish. <laughs> That's yeah. Good. Yeah, actually, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I had done a bunch of soundscapes called um, Sonic Soul Food. So that's also, some of those are on uh, my SoundCloud. Some of them are on Instagram, but yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Well, we had a bunch of people ask if you, because um, yeah, we, so many references were mentioned in our conversation and in your presentation. And so if we could um, download the chat because Stephanie, my colleague, um, yeah, for sure. was, was helping. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that tomorrow and send it out so people can have yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to see those. But it's 9.30 where you are, so I'm going to let you get some rest. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Emma, and thank, thank you, you for everybody who made this, this sharing this talk possible. Yeah, and I'll send you the link to the recording, too, so you can take a look at it. Great. Enjoy your evening. Thank you so much, really. You oh, that was incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Is that Courtney? That's Courtney. <laughs> Courtney. It's Stephanie. I loved it. I love, I just, your work just moves me deeper and deeper and deeper each time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Mm.
All right, I'm yeah. waving goodbye, well, but I'm not on the camera. So good night. <laughs> good night, everyone. Bye.